Hey everyone, Corey with the Grand Rapids Symphony here talking with Peter Ungian, who's our guest conductor for this weekend. Thank you for being here. Great pleasure. So we want to talk about this weekend's concert for people who might not know about the music or the, the concert itself. So let's start off with talking about um, any special stories or connections you have to the music on the program. Several, actually. Um, I mean, we might as well start with, with the Mozart Piano Concerto, which right. is the second piece on the program. And it features a pianist called Jeffrey Kahane, magnificent American pianist, whom I have known since 1976. Wow. Uh oh, yeah, that reveals a few things about both of us. <laughs> but um, he is a great pianist, a great musician, also a very fine conductor, also one of the very few pianists in the world who can improvise in almost any style, wow. but jazz improvisation, classical, whatever, whatever you want. So we used to have a game where we'd give him our phone numbers, and he would just play the notes of the phone number, you know, that was and then he would create a, like a five minute, it was a party trick of his, and a, a five minute piece, it, it all improvised. Um, anyway, he's a beautiful, beautiful artist, I mean, one of the great interpreters of Mozart, and the piece itself is exquisitely beautiful, and very, very optimistic um, mm -hmm. in, in every way, really elegant and moving and so on. And the first piece on the program is a wind serenade. Now that's something you don't get very often. I mean, it's almost always when you come to an orchestra concert, you've got all these string players, and then you have the wind section, mm -hmm. and then behind them the horns and the brass off to the side, and the percussion and timpani and so on. Well, the first piece on this program features just 13 players, all wind players. Uh, horns count as winds in this context. Okay. Um, and it's by Strauss. It's a very early piece, over seven, by Richard Strauss. Not the Johann Strauss of the waltzes, but... Uh, very, very beautiful, and it's wonderful to hear that texture. So the whole first half is is just exquisite music, and it's pretty much all in E flat major as it happens. There you go. Not that one has to know that, but then we have an intermission, and we come back, and we are in a completely different guise because we're going to perform a symphony by Shostakovich, his eleventh symphony, which is one of the most terrifying pieces of music ever written, and powerful and brilliant, and so moving. I mean, it's jarring. Okay, subject matter. 1905, January 9th, um, that's in this week, right, mm -hmm. January 9th, yeah. 115 years ago, there was this horrendous massacre in the Palace Square in St. Petersburg, mm -hmm. when um, a lot of working people, um, men, women, children, elderly, moved towards this Palace Square on a Sunday morning. It's known as Bloody Sunday, actually, of okay. course. And uh, they were there to hope that the Tsar was in his winter palace. Um, and it, it turned out, as they approached, that the Tsar was never going to even be there. But his troops were there, and they opened fire oh. on these people and literally murdered some number between a thousand and three or four thousand. It's very difficult to get the precise history on these kinds of things um, because naturally it would have been hidden in any case. Plus, it's many long, many many years ago. Uh, there were no cameras there or anything like that, of course. So. Um, but it was an incredible tragedy, and it moved Shostakovich many, many years later, in fact, in 1958, to write a symphony telling the tale of this. So that there are four movements, and it's played without interruption. <clears throat> the first movement depicts the early morning in the palace square, and the atmosphere is incredibly chilling, and you, know, you sense a feeling of anticipation, but it's very, very still, and in the distance you have rumbling drums and fanfares and mm. trumpet and horn, and you get the sense that there's something threatening out in the distance. So it, it's it's very much like cinema, in, in like theatre as a symphony, and more than almost any symphony I know. Um, so we set that scene uh, in the the first movement has some a couple of songs, famous songs, Russian songs, prisoner songs, um, which are featured but very delicately, and it's really mesmerising. <clears throat> out of that, suddenly, the second movement, it starts, and you feel the anticipation and the nervousness. Very fast tempo, um, very dramatic theme, and an incredible build-up of tension. Uh, you, you know, you feel the desperation of the people right, as this build-up takes place. And then, suddenly, it calms down again. You get the fanfares again, and then the snare drum comes. And... That is the first shots mm. of these, you know, pre-First World War machine type guns, right? That yeah. were, were being used. Um, and the panic of the people. And there's about a three minute passage here, which is really describes in musical terms, the massacre. It's completely powerful and petrifying. Um, and 
it, then it suddenly ends and you're left with this deathly kind of stillness. In fact, the theme is exactly the same as the beginning of the symphony, but with these eerie trills. Oh, wow. And it, it's just so uncomfortable. And then the sound of the harp and the celeste of all instruments, just making this very odd, eccentric kind of punctuation to the atmosphere. And then, of course, you hear, again, trumpets disappearing into the background, as if to say, there's more where that came from. Really foul. In it almost seems cinematic, almost. It yeah. totally, it is. Wow, that's amazing. It's I mean, people come to the symphony, they just cannot believe what they're hearing. Okay, next movement is a theme that um, is in memoriam. It's in memory of these people. Okay. So we kind of jump into a different realm in a way, but without any interruption. And then suddenly we get a build-up of defiance and courage and power coming from these working people, really. And... Um, it is so ennobling um, and, and gives us such a sense of, of faith in, in human confidence in, in, in the face of such adversity. Um, and that movement, again, it ends very quietly with the same theme as with which it began, very quiet. And then the last movement, Toxin, is the alarm bell. And that movement really talks about the power, the revenge. And then just before the end, there's an extended solo, which is really moving, very touching, in the English horn. That's the, the third instrument in the oboe section that's a kind of a, an oboe with, with a, um, a deeper register. Um, and it's a very beautiful, the uh, English horn player is wonderful, wonderful in, in this orchestra. Um, and then the final passage is, is just uh, so powerful and so dramatic and it, it uh, almost amplifies the, this toxin, this idea of the alarm bell, that we can respond to a calling of this kind with great power and courage. It's, it's phenomenal, Symphony. It sounds so great. Um, what I love about this program, too, is that uh, there's this, you get an entire palette of symphonic music. You start with the first half, it's very beautiful, very colorful, very bright, and then you go to this, this sort of contrasting dark intensity, which I think is really unique for a program. You're absolutely right. I mean, you know, it's very unusual that you hear a piece just with the winds, and then you hear the ultimate in classical music beauty with a Mozart and, and the, the piano concertos. Are, you know, his operas are so great. All of his music is great, but the piano concertos really stand, I think, at the pinnacle of his creative powers. And, and it's so, it's a perfect piece. And then you take the orchestra, much bigger orchestra, uh, and, and all of a sudden it becomes a totally different animal. So, yeah, it's a Wonderful. I'm excited about it. You did a great elaboration on, um, on the Shostakovich and things people should listen for with Mozart and with Strauss. Are there things people in the audience should be listening for uh, with, with those pieces? Well, you know, what's interesting about, uh, I'll start with the Mozart. I mean, it's the conversation that's always so wonderful. Um, you know, the, the clarinet was an instrument that was just developing at that time. And this is the first concerto in which he uses clarinets instead of oboes. So you have a flute, clarinets, and bassoons, and then horns, two trumpets, and timpani, and strings. And the, so it's very interesting to listen for the, for the way Mozart used the clarinet. He, okay. he, he, he really sort of promoted the clarinet as instrument. In fact, his last completed piece before he wrote the Requiem, which he did not complete, was a magnificent clarinet concerto. So there's that. There's also the conversation with the piano and the orchestra is always so powerful. And then there are these things called cadenzas, where we, we stop at a certain moment with a sense of anticipation, and then the pianist goes off and can play something. And Jeff, of course, has his own cadences. A lot of people will use, um, uh, you know, maybe something that Beethoven wrote, although many composers wrote cadences for Mozart concertos. Jeff d does his own. Oh, yeah. So that's really something interesting to listen for. Um, the slow movement is, is e exquisite. The last movement is very joyous, but has a rather unusual uh, sort of interlude, where suddenly everything stops, and you think there might be a cadenza, and there's actually a slow andantino passage, um, which is really quite unusual mm -hmm. at that stage in a concerto, in a finale, which is usually just a, a joyous ending to a piece. Mm -hmm. And then uh, at the end of that, we go one more time. Although, of course, Jeff, knowing him, has another cadenza at the end, and I suspect he will, he will reiterate a little bit of that andante. Depends what he feels like. Um, <laughs> so, that, I mean, that would be very interesting because there's a lot of spontaneity in, mm -hmm. whenever Jeff's on stage. Um, and f as far as the winds are concerned, they will be for the first time, it, 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 I mean, they may have done wind 
program uh, pieces at least in the past but it's very unusual to have the wind players sitting where the front stands of the strings are traditionally yeah. sitting so it'll be an opportunity to hear the winds much more close up and personal as it were um, and and the beautiful elegant harmonies of Strauss which is moving into the romantic period so we we have a representation of the, of the classical period uh, you know Mozart at the end of the 1780s or something like that um, and then we have Strauss um, who was one of the great romantic composers even though he lived till after the Second World War he always remained a, sure. a really a 19th century composer mm -hmm. in, in, many, in many respects and then one of the giants of the 20th century so it's a lot of variety that's excellent I love that description that's good for people to know to what to hear especially if they're first-time symphony goers because we get a lot of those here in Grand Rapids, and that's okay, you know. It's there's there's it's there's very no, okay. <laughs> there's 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 no real entry level for classical music. You just come in and you enjoy it and you feel what you feel. I, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people we've made the mistake somehow in, in in our world of seeing, you know, a bit elitist and intellectual and so on. I mean, anybody who comes to music like this, whatever it is about the music they enjoy, is fine. You don't need to be knowledgeable. In fact, to be perfectly honest, some of the most knowledgeable people I know in this field have the most difficulty enjoying any concert mm -hmm. because they think they know too much. You know, they shouldn't be played that way or whatever. If come in, listen spontaneously and react spontaneously. I love that. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for sitting with me, having this conversation. Uh, for those of you out there, please join us this weekend, Friday or Saturday. Uh, if you attend Friday night, you can attend Talk Back after the concert and ask Peter some more questions. If anything he said sparked an interest, uh, stop by. Otherwise, we'll see you this weekend. Thanks so much. Thank you.